All right. So uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, coming and joining me today. I was asked to give a presentation on the Tranquility Trading Tower and the Tranquility Trading Consortium uh, about two weeks ago. And over the course of the last week or so, we've managed to finally get a date locked in. And here we are. So what I'm going to cover is going to be an assortment of things around the Tranquility Trading Tower and Consortium and how we operate and what we represent within the EVE cluster. And it should be a pretty short presentation and hopefully you can get something out of it. If not, uh, at the end, I'll do a Q&A and certainly I'm sure there'll be at least a few questions from interested parties. So, uh, usually the way I start a presentation is kind, kind of trying to describe who I am. So, within EVE, so I am Vili, uh, which is a name that I e either have or have adopted over the course of time. I've been playing EVE for roughly 19 years now, maybe longer. You lose track of time very quickly. I am the longest running FC in EVE, so I started originally FCing back in 2006, and there's nobody else still FCing from that time period. I was the leader of the Legacy Coalition at one point, uh, which is obviously now defunct and dead. I am a four-time CSM member of CSM 2, 14, 15, and 16, and during my tenure as the leader of the Legacy Coalition and the military commander of TEST, uh, was put in a position where I was the one anchoring and establishing the Tranquility Trading Towers, which would later become the Tranquility Trading Consortium. Uh, it has given me a significant view into the wider EVE ecosystem, especially the high sec and uh, other areas of EVE, and it allows me to kind of get a, a pretty broad view that it enables me to, to see how things are going and it allows me to maintain a finger on the pulse of you, I guess you could say. So what I'm going to talk about today in totality is going to be the history of the towers and consortium, uh, the facilities we offer, and how you can utilize those facilities for your own benefit. I'm going to talk about the diplomacy that we engage in and how we operate within the EVE cluster. And I'm going to talk about the many and many uh, controversial ways in which we are viewed, because certainly no discussion of the TTT would be remiss without discussion of how evil we all are. Sorry. So history. Um, when CCP ch introduced Citadels back in 2016 and enabled players to make revenue from the taxes that were generated from players trading in Citadels, a player that many of you may not know, or a one of the original boggers of EVE, Greedy Goblin made a prediction that, and this is in 2016, long before the tower was ever put up, that all of the powers of Nullsec would come together to take over the server's trade. Uh, he was wrong in many points of his predictions, but many other points he, he was very correct, which is a very kind of ironic thing because he had been known for being along the line of what we would now call like a schizo poster or something of that sort. Uh, very much uh, saying a lot of crazy things, but every once in a while the clock is correct once or twice a day, and certainly his predictions were correct. Uh, so from 2016 to 2018, there was an assortment of Four desires that were owned by a variety of the people who conducted plex trading and the various entities that lived in high sec. And at the time, the the four desires or the plex trade alone from the Jita area, which is almost the entirety of the market they were established at, taking at that time, represented anywhere from 300 to 400 bill a month in terms of possible revenue revenue generation. And as such, there was a number of very interested high sec players. Who were dropping four desires, fighting over their four desires, and such. There was a variety of wars over those, but they were all very minor in scale. And then, in the process 
of engaging in a war with Pandemic Horde uh, Test Alliance, the alliance I was leading at the time, uh, we decided we would attack Horde's position within these high sec Fortizar market controlling groups, and we would cut them out. And so we destroyed their Fortizar, cutting off the trade, and to cement our position and cut them off from it, we dropped the original Tranquility Trading Keepstar. Uh, at the time, it was only necessarily there to cut off someone else from the trade. Uh, we saw it as an opportunity to uh, lock others out because a Keepstar is a much more beefy thing to engage against and the extra size, the extra defenses, the extra hit points you have to go through just make it that much more difficult to to fight against. And with the dropping of the Keepstar and then shortly after the Satios and the Tatara that would generate the tranquility or the perimeter trading complex, we would see a significant amount of, of wars uh, for the first couple months or after the dropping of the tower in 2018. Uh, we had a number of the high sex group come up with war deck us. We learned about all of the fun high sec war deck mechanics. And we even at one point lost one of the Tech 2 Tatars that we had originally dropped just due to not truly understanding the high sec war deck mechanics at the time. Just because if you if you once you spend enough time with them, you will absolutely learn how you can abuse those mechanics to your advantage. Uh, we, we've certainly paid the price to learn all of those mechanics over time. So eventually, uh, the war went on, and the war went on, and the war went on, and we, we started cutting deals. We cut a deal with Pandemic Horde, and we cut a deal with ICY, and over the course of, the, after about five or six months, I believe, we were in a position where Horde and Test had come to an agreement along with the high sec players through ICY, and we also decided to cut in the Imperium as they had been an ally of Test at the time, and they had supported us in the consortium's existence. So they were cut in as well, just, just because they had supported, and I had very much believed that it was important that we get them involved. Uh, this was the original Tranquility Trading Consortium establishment. There is a written treaty that we have from the original time, and it is pretty thorough. And at this point, we have officially kind of established the consortium. Everybody is now hooked in. Uh, there is a number of unnamed parties that are also being paid monthly uh, from the outside, including groups like Snuff and uh, Volta, who, who are just receiving money on the side to ensure that there's no possible attack on the towers from any group of relative strength. And life is good. And it would settle and stay that way for about two to three years. The consortium uh, would make a significant amount of money, uh, start, starting to hit into the trillions after the trade had kind of settled and the trade had um, become more confident in our ability to survive and our ability to present them a reasonable benefits that they could take advantage of. Uh, be in this period, you would also see the anchoring of the Tranquility Rebel Tower, which was the Keepstar and Ignoiton, uh, which would later be destroyed by Snuff during the course of World War B. Uh, this was more of an experiment to see if we could offer reaction services and super capital trading from a safe Keepstar in LOSEC, but obviously LOSEC is a very different beast with very different constraints. And in the end, when the time came, for the Tranquility Rebel Tower to uh, be attacked and come down, uh, we weren't overly upset. The money we were paying in additional protection services for that tower uh, were far exceeding what it was generating in revenue, and there was very, very little uh, advantage to it being up at the time. Uh, we would also later come in and take over a piece of the new Kaldari complex that was owned by another group, I believe Mogul, who were looking to get themselves out of the high sex structure business, partly because of the amount you generally have to pay in high sec to ensure that your structures stay alive or the amount of work you have to put in keeping them alive. So they were looking to get out and they wanted to take care of 
their customers and the people that had used their structures. And so they sold them all to us, knowing that we would take care of their the people that use their structures and we would ensure that they, they stayed up. Uh, then throughout the course of the Second World War B, the Tranquility Trading Towers were a common, common theme of discussion. Uh, despite the towers being as neutral as I could make them throughout the course of the war, they were certainly a point of contention and certainly something that everybody liked to bring up. But nonetheless, uh, their operation throughout the war helped fuel that war, ensuring that there was a significant amount of content taking place. And when the tax changes uh, were implemented by CCP in 2021, I believe it was, uh, just near the end of the war, uh, it served as kind of a an important kind of kick in the nuts for all the players in terms of their revenue. So the tower did not play a gigantic role within the war, but it definitely played at least a, a small role. With all that being said, uh, the towers are, as ever, operating very safely, very comfortably right now. And we have currently uh, formalized the domain tranquility trading structures at, under our umbrella. Uh, that happened a while back, to be fair. And are looking at the next possible expansions, with that being probably more production SOTOs in the perimeter area, just to ensure that we're giving the best level of service we can. So that's kind of a quick rundown of the history of the Tranquility Trading Consortium and how it's kind of came to be and where we're going in the future. But obviously when it comes to the future of the towers, everything is kind of at the mercy of the EVE political scene. So when it comes to the tower itself, uh, the tower is not just the tower. When we talk about the consortium, uh, we have a lot of structures doing a lot of different things. Uh, we make our money from the tax on trade in the perimeter trading tower, which is our by far our number one source of income. But we also have reliable cloning services right next to JITA, which is a major uh, source of money because our clones are actually safe. And we off offer offices at all these locations so people can utilize their corporate contracting uh, most effectively near JITA without actually having to pay multiple billion a month for a JITA office. Uh, in perimeter, we have a complete four piece industry complex. So the double SOTO with all four rigs, plus the only T2 refined rigged Tatara, I think anywhere's in high sec, although I could be wrong now. Uh, next door to Perimeter and Ayanursta, we have a research rig Sotio, along with a complete Raytaru T2 rigged setup, including a T2 Athenor for refinery. In Marassi, we have a production Sotio, just to assist further people off of Jita. And in New Caldari, we have a mixed four piece, which is the one we inherited, uh, which has an Athenor, a pair of Sotios, and a no, correction, an Asbel Sotio and an Athenor. So just a variety of structures all around Gita, ensuring that we offer people uh, really the best production services they can get because if we didn't offer the best, they'd just go somewhere else just because the proximity to Gita creates a really high level of production index, which means it's really expensive to produce close to Gita. So if they're going to do it there, we need to be offering them the best. And although it's not listed here, we also have the domain facilities, which offer uh, another production SOTO down there. So the benefits of using the TTTC. So my vision when we put down or when we decided that we were going to take the Keepstar and do more with it than just be a trading tower meant to cut off someone else from the market was to provide absolute st security, absolute stability, and to provide the best possible services at the best possible price. Our original best possible price wasn't the lowest possible price. It was at a 0.3% tax rate instead of a possible 0.1. Uh, due to the way taxes work now, that was changed where we, we basically had to go down to 1%. But certainly, we um, we endeavored to provide the best possible services 
for our customers. So that's why we took the time to tech two rig the Tatar instead of T1 to establish the best possible CTOs. We wanted to outcompete our competitors uh, without even having to compete. We, we wanted to offer the best. And at times I, I've paid a, a cost for that and certainly it hasn't always been the most financially correct decision to establish things in the best possible way to set them up with the with the most expensive rigs and such, especially when I look at the losses in Yoiton. But definitely I, I've always wanted to ensure that when people are coming to trade with us, build with us, refine with us, we're giving them the best possible services we can. So the big benefit of using the Tranquility Trading Tower uh, to market trade with us is cost savings. If you look on the right there, I've got three pictures. Uh, the top picture is a broker's fee of 3% and a sales tax of 8%. Uh, that is what an unskilled uh, with no standings character generally pays to trade in Jita. That is 11% tax on your sales orders. Uh, the second picture is what my my personal market alt pays in terms of tax in Jita which is a broker's fee of 1.26%, which is a pretty solid or pretty high level of standings with Kaldari, and then a perfect skills 3.6%. And at the very bottom, you can see the broker's fee of 1% and sales tax 3.6, which is what a correct skilled character in perimeter pays, which is the lowest you can go, which is a 4.6%. Technically, you can get a tiny bit below the 1%, is my understanding, if you have perfect, perfect standings with Kaldari, but to, to do so requires a level of standings that almost nobody has. Uh, so understanding that means that every trade you do at the tower versus in Jita, unless you have significant standings, uh, you're paying about 2% more assuming no standings. And if you have any level of, of skills, uh, it, 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 that factor can be uh, more as well. So, 2% doesn't sound like a lot, but when you trade in any significant amount, it, it it adds up very quick. And because you can utilize trading from a station away through the, I believe it's the remote trading skill, I can't remember what it's called at the top of my head right now, uh, there, there's very little incentive to do direct trading in Jita if you know how to do it. We offer near-perfect construction rigs in Perimeter, Morassi, and Ionerst as well, so uh, the Sotios are not T2 rig because those are beyond even the expense that we can endure. Uh, and the Tech 2 construction components to get those are extremely difficult to procure. But T1 triple rig Sotios in high sec are pretty rare to find. And when you do find them, that's about as good as you're going to get in high sec just flat out. And any more than that is even rare. And ex incredibly rare in no sec. I think there might be three or four T2 rig Sotios in all of the game. Uh, so you're getting near perfect construction as well. The big thing that we offer as part of the Tranquility Trading uh, Consortium is stability and security. Structures in a high sec have an extremely short average lifespan. There are a lot of groups that roam around the galaxy looking to blow up stuff. Uh, every day you'll see Black Flag or Wrecking Crew or whoever else just killing random structures in a high sec because they can, because it's free loot for them. Uh, any group in high sec that has structures and isn't getting their structures killed by those groups generally is paying them. And we are one of those groups. Uh, we pay for the security from all of the relevant high sec parties. Let me rephrase. We pay from, for protection from the high sec parties that are the strongest, and they obviously protect uh, your interest from any other small groups. So if, you, if our structures in high sec are, are generally an absolutely secure bet and even in the case where we didn't have that security we would have the backing of the nullsec groups who take all of the revenue of the towers much the same people uh, looking to leave clones in random spots uh, the tower is by far the default for a lot of people just because they know of the security technically you can do it in jita now uh, which is very helpful to people but certainly there's a lot, a lot of clones in the tower, and should it ever fall one day, that'll be an expensive clone bill for sure. 
And then offices. We offer offices for 25 mil all throughout our structures and the price never changes. It's not a good price for an office necessarily, but it is a reasonable price for an office that is 100% or 99% secure. So that is what we offer to players and we have literally hundreds if not thousands of corporations staging from our structures at this point who utilize those facilities and those opportunities daily. So diplomacy, and this is kind of where things get interesting when it comes to talking about the Tranquility Trading Tower. The Tranquility Trading Tower is an everyone wins situation. Uh, it is not often viewed like that, but it is absolutely that kind of a situation. Because the, we are effectively competing with the bank. The only person that loses in this situation is the EVE Online tax faucet. Uh, by trading with the TTT, by using our structures, by generating money through our structures, the only person who's not getting paid or who's losing money is CCP's tax faucet. We enable people to trade at the lowest broker fee, and all of that broker fee that is taken is then redistributed to a number of groups. And all of those groups, without exception, make more money than any other situation possible. So should the towers fall, none of the groups involved would be able to pull off an additional tower much the same and generate as much money as the tower currently does for them. That creates an incentive for stability and an incentive for the status quo. Uh, I'll try to explain this as best I can, but basically, let's say we generate 300 million ISK. Now, I'm not gonna talk billions because that's a different situation, but let's just say 300 million ISK is generated for Horde a month. If Horde were to put up their own Fortizar, the level of trade would be probably below 50% of what the TTC does because of its stability, which means that at most they could generate, let's say 150, but they're also gonna have to fight for that 150 with other people who wanna get that 150. And it just creates that situation where the status quo where everybody is okay with the TTC enables a situation where they all make more money than they would otherwise, and they all do less work than they would otherwise. And that is probably one of the most important pieces in, in why the TTC has been so successful is because the stability is there, it enables people to feel good trading there, which generates more trade, which ensures that the trade that everybody is enjoying is more than they would ever be able to enjoy on their own. Uh, when it comes to the diplomacy, we also manage the risks and dangers. So I do a non-significant amount of work keeping an eye on who the players are in high sec and low sec and null sec, understanding the political environment we're working with, and I do my best to preempt problems. That means if a group is looking to attack the TTC, as we've had many times in high sec, I'm looking for ways to identify who they're going to work with, maybe cut those people in, maybe find ways to get those people uh, discouraged in other ways. Uh, we're, we're always on the lookout for possible threats and ways to cut those threats off at the knees before they become real threats. And the biggest way to do that, obviously, is to know the most important players. So when it comes to, for example, when we were in, in high, low sec is a great example, the key players in, in low sec at the time were Snuff and... Oh, I can't remember them now. They're dead. It was a low sec group that was based in US Tabson. I can't remember them now, but we ensured as soon as we moved into low sec that these, these groups were well, were paid off, that they were taken care of and that they were able, comfortable with us being there. Obviously snuff decided to change their mind at one point. Uh, but nonetheless, it, it's about knowing the key players. And in high sec, we ensure that we know who the key players are in high sec and in null sec so that we can ensure that they are, with us and not uncomfortable with our operations. Uh, the other big trick is ensuring transparency. So all of the money that comes into the TTT is fully auditable by the people who are pulling money out of the TTT. So everybody is able to look at the wallets, understand what's going on, and nobody feels that anything underhanded is going on because nothing really can. Uh, this ensures that everybody is comfortable and everybody, whether they like it or not, necessarily can't 
say that something underhanded is taking place. Uh, that transparency is really important, and it helps us uh, survive situations and complex uh, diplomatic wordings that might otherwise uh, kind of sink us. Uh, and interacting with us. So this is uh, a pretty simple thing. Anybody that wants to interact with the TTT in any particular way, they can always just send me an email on the TTT CEO character. Uh, generally, I, I review those emails once or twice a week, if not more. Uh, there's actually very few of them. We don't accept new corporations into the TTT. We don't uh, accept players into the corporation itself because it's mostly just a holding corp. Uh, but all we're ever really going to say is, as long as you don't shoot the tower, we have no issues with you, and as long as you don't drop competing structures in uh, the forge, we're not going to have any problems with you. So th that's really the only interactions we generally have with people, but every once in a while somebody comes up with a cool idea or so, a cool question. Uh, so there's always uh, a relevant thing to talk about there. And then why there will be never be a second TTT. And, and that's an interesting thing, but it's something I've talked about a lot over the years. Uh, the first is always the best. And... At this point, if there was a second TTT, or the, if the first TTT was to die, uh, the chances are a second TTT would not be successful in the same way because a large percentage of the reason this first one is so successful is because of its viewed invincibility. I don't believe the structure is by any means invincible. Uh, it very definitely can die if the right conditions are met. Uh, but the second uh, tower will never have the same level of viewed invincibility that the first one has. And because of that, people will never see it as with the same level of stability. They'll never be as comfortable trading in the second one as they are the first and so on. And, and that's a, a really important factor that helps play into the how to create an everyone win situation as well. So failure points. Uh, and this is kind of a, a really weird one to talk about, but it, it's important to say. Uh, the TTT is run by me. Uh, so I'm the only person that holds directorship in the tower and I have given nobody else the rules to trade or transfer the towers. All of your assets in, are, are safe, but in the end, everything relies on me in that regard. Um, nonetheless, I have no incentive to do anything bad. And obviously I'm one of those people who view my word uh, as worth more than any of those kind of things could ever generate. So aside from me, uh, th th there's no real risk in the tower being stolen, the tower being compromised, any of those things that are common for the ways in which ta structures like that fall. And I don't consider myself, and you should not consider my, me uh, a, a risk in that regard. And then the obvious failure point is the war to come. So certainly there is no doubt the tower will fall eventually. It could be three months from now, it could be three years from now, it could be ten years from now. Um, I truly can't say when that failure point will come. Uh, but eventually enough people will get mad at us that they will come for us and they will try to destroy us. Uh, but when that happens, it'll be pretty obvious and it's only a 1% asset safety to get your, or even if it's 1%, I think it might be half a percent, to asset safety your stuff in ISEC from the same system. And certainly I don't think anyone should be overly concerned about that point. And then unaligned. Uh, so this is just talking about, I just wanted to add a little section about here. High sec life is a very quiet life and the TTT lives that life by being the big bank. That's, to a degree, what we aim to be. We aim to provide people with services and to not piss anybody off. And to a degree, that is how you can be successful in high sec more often than not, by being friends, not enemies, or being neutral and not enemies. Generally, in high sec, it has been my estimation that most people want to find ways to pick fights or want to help others, and there, there seems to be very little in the middle. And then when it comes to boundaries with us and others, um, always talk to people as much as you can and try to find a way to to operate in, in, in the, the best of faith. So I had a slide in here for controversy, but I, I seem to have dropped it. 
Uh, so I, I just did want to take a, ta a second here to talk about the discussion of, of the TTT as well. So over the years, uh, the TTT has been an incredibly controversial topic. Many people view the way in which we operate as being bad for the game. Uh, they see the fact that our operation generates a significant amount of ISK, and that ISK directly goes into a number of NullSec alliances as being a problem, and they view the fact that we have a Keepstar in HiSec as also being a problem. The reality of those claims is that generally they are somewhat unfounded to slightly founded. Uh, the Keepstar and HiSec problem is not really a problem if any group could get the numbers required to take the tower down. Uh, the tower is defended by people, not by its hit points. And that is always going to be the truth. The reason it has survived and why it is viewed as, inv is, is viewed as invincible is not because of its hit points and its damage cap and the difficulty in operating in, in high lag environments. It is because most people know a thousand or more people would come to defend it. And when it comes to the discussion about paying off NullSec alliances, uh, and that somehow being bad, I'm not going to argue that alliances getting money is good or bad. It is just a thing. However, the alliances that take this ISK are almost always going to be spending that money directly back on their members. And there are a number of alliances that don't get mentioned uh, that receive ISK from us as well over the years, especially, uh, that also enjoy that ISK and put it to good use. Taking money and giving it to alliances enables those alliances to do fun things with it. And I think anyone that doesn't appreciate that generally is only doing so from a position of wanting to be in on the score, uh, which is a controversial take, I know. But the only people I have found that are truly opposed to the TTT are doing so usually from an opinion of either jealousy or ignorance, and it's always tricky to say. Uh, with that being said, I will move to the Q&A, and I, I'm sure there will be some people with interesting or controversial views on the TTT, and I'm, I'll be more than happy to take questions about it. Uh, that concludes the chat, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, Eve University for hosting me and being pretty pleasant and trying to set this up. Uh, it was on their request. Uh, certainly, I don't normally go around talking about the TTD, but uh, it's been an interesting experience coming here and talking with you all for them. So, thank you very much. So I, in the process of preparing this, I went and found one of the original drafts for the TTT agreement. Uh, I'll see if I can find it here for you. Uh, uh, just trying to open it here on Discord. Did that come through? Draft the Forge Treaty? Oh yeah, we see it. So this was one of the original um, drafts of the treaty. The treaty nowadays doesn't look quite like this. Obviously many iterations of the tower have, have changed considerably. Um, but what usually happens is that a group of players would work you know, we come to a situation where we need an agreement. And then once you have the realization that you need an agreement, you need to decide how you're going to uh, work that agreement out. Uh, in this situation, this was the Imperium's Corp Diplo uh, preparing this agreement. Uh, 
which was an odd choice of who, who would doing it, but I think I may have actually done a similar first draft as well. And just trying to figure out, you know, all of the various problems that may occur, you know, who gets what and who pays for what and how things are worked out. Because anytime you have situations where money is going to be involved, players are going to be very particular and there's going to be lots of opportunities for drama. People don't want to feel left out. People don't want to feel cheated. And it's important that transparency is always really high. Which So when you have those kind of situations, you want to ensure that everybody feels comfortable with things. And, and that's why you end up having these, these very formal, very serious agreements. If that kind of answers the question. Yeah, and maybe just like who, who signs it? Is it uh, people signing it with uh, Zimitani and Billy, or are you actually the original it with... si signatories to the agreement were Mitani, myself, and Gobbins, I believe. Cool. And then ICY was just working with Horde at the time, so I think Gobbins kind of notionally signed for them, although I'm sure they agreed with it. I have like two, three more questions, but maybe anybody else? Yeah, yeah. If anybody questions? has any questions, I'm I'm usually pretty open about this stuff, so don't be afraid. I have a question. You said that during one of the wars, uh, conflict arose about the, the topic of the towers. How was that, I guess, resolved? And what, what form does the, like, we don't like it anymore, we don't like you, so we don't like them? So the original agreement was written at a time when Test and Imperium were best of friends. So during the course of World War B2, uh, many people had thought that perhaps that agreement would change, and certainly on both sides, I'm sure, because I know it was a topic of discussion at several points on the Pappy side, um, to dropping you know goons out of the TTT, and I'm sure they had many discussions about attacking the TTT, both seeing it as an opportunity to weaken their uh, enemy. Uh, as kind of the guy making the decisions at the at the tower itself, I pretty much said we're going to continue on with the agreement until we have a reason not to. And obviously there was a lot of flack from both sides, you know, for people saying we should do this to attack or hurt our enemy. And then on the other side, you would have people saying, how is this a real war if both sides are still generating money from this same uh, asset? But in the end... Uh, the tower did manage to remain neutral, partly, I think, because one side wasn't sure they could defend it and one side wasn't sure they could successfully attack it. So neither might not have necessarily seen uh, the reward there if they broke the agreement. Or maybe both sides just wanted to ensure that they kept to their agreements, which is a, is a very serious thing in Nullsec and something that doesn't have a clear value, but has a value that is very unquantifiable, which is the value of your word. And agreements in EVE can be tricky, but certainly everyone wants to always ensure that their word is maintained as much as humanly possible, because once it's gone, you, you never can get it back. So Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, it sounds like they were toying with the idea of blowing this up, but that sounds sort of nuclear since it hurts everybody and hurts ourselves as well. Correct. And when you say toying with the idea of blowing it up, I think it's much more a situation of toying with the idea of attacking, right? Because unfortunately, in, especially throughout the course of that war, there was no guarantee you would be successful, right? And then you've created a situation where you've broken the agreement to conduct the attack. And if you're not successful, then you're out of the agreement and you've lost you know, that income but you've gained nothing, right? And you've strengthened your opponents because they now they're going to be cutting you out of the agreement. Thank you. Thank you. Well, any others? Yeah, but yeah. You, you know how, how diplomacy, diplomacy keeps, keeps um, the, um, the tower, tower safe? safe? Back, in Back in April or... or of 2022, 2022 the, the Serenity, Serenity trading tower, tower was destroyed by a huge by fleet of Vexers. It gets, gets to the point, point where you think there is a battle. Is a battle. Uh, like, uh, what sort of what fleet do you think would be taking down the tower, tower if you could imagine? imagine. Uh, so we have we've kind of game theoried a number of different fleets. It's important to remember that when the tower died on Serenity, it died to an attacking force that was 
two times, I think, or maybe more, the size of the defenders because the Serenity server had shifted so abruptly away from uh, PIBC, I think it was. Uh, so it went from a situation where PIBC had, you know, two, three to one, four to one, five to one kind of numbers against the rest of the whole server to all of a, situa- all of a sudden a situation where they were kind of one of the smaller alliances, right? So it created a situation where all of a sudden, numerically, you don't have that advantage. I don't personally think the tower is particularly defendable if you do not have a numerical advantage. Uh, Structures and high sec are, by definition, weaker than structures and nullsec because they don't have some of the key points, like a PDS, like a Doomsday. Uh, it's just a big pile of, of uh, hit points. So if you can chew through those hit points, you can reinforce or kill the structure. And if you don't have a defensive fleet larger than your opponents, I, I definitely don't feel like the structure is particularly defensible. Uh, and if your enemy brings fleet X, then you bring fleet Y, or they bring fleet Y, you bring, you bring fleet Z. Uh, obviously, there's counterplay to every different type of fleet, uh, but that would be a situation, or uh, that would be based on the situation how it is. If they brought vexers, there's a number of different things you can do to vexer fleets. They are not actually all that strong, to be honest. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, yeah. I was just really interested. Really interested. No, absolutely. How much, How much like, like, disc, disc per, per month, month does, does the Tranquility Trading Consortium bring in, in profit? profit? So I can't discuss what it... Well, I'm not going to publicly discuss what it brings in now. Uh, I will say it brought in, in its early months, three to 400. And at its best months, it was averaging about 1.7 trill. That was pre all of the tax changes and such. So it's somewhere between those two numbers, but um, it's uh, it's not on the high side anymore, and it's not on the low side either. So that kind of gives you a, a reasonable range, I think. But about as much as I can kind of meaningfully give. It's also difficult to fathom this size. It, it is, but on the alliance scale that amount of ISK is not as much as you would think. When you start talking about paying two, three, four, five hundred billion ISK in Alliance uh, infrastructure, paying solve bills, paying Sinojammer bills, paying for Alliance SRP, and then you start taking that amount of ISK and you're splitting it two, three, four, five, six ways, uh, it can go very, very quickly. All of these amounts of ISK are, are, are nice, don't get me wrong, and they're important to a variety of different alliances, and that amount of money generally can be extremely helpful in the running of an alliance, but it certainly by no means uh, is anything truly insane, as crazy as that may sound to say. How much are maintenance costs, or are you also not going to talk about that? Uh, I mean, the maintenance costs are literally just fuel. Uh, So we obviously pay a number of groups for security and th- those agreements are confidential um but as- aside from that it's just fuel and the fuel for 20 or 30 structures runs in the 5 to 10 billion a month range i think something like that it- it's nothing overly insane it's pretty reasonable or pretty small factor i guess you would say So the net profit that's between like three hundred and seventeen hundred billion a month, like that's what's going to the null blocks, not the protection racket money going to the high set people. So the cuts to the null block alliances are made after protection payments. Protection payments are considered an expense in this regard, and they're made uh, accordingly. Yeah, if you allow me another question, I'm I'm a bit curious. I, I, about... I'm I'm willing to sit here for another twenty or thirty minutes to answer yeah, questions. Perfect. Like so that. so I'm I'm curious about sort of the the bigger economic questions, especially with sort of CCP doing quite a bit in in the area of you know broker tax, sale tax, uh, doing some changes. So I don't know. I mean, you don't have to you know say cor- you know concrete numbers, but maybe you could talk a bit about uh, 
sort of how how was the impact on the TTT when the the I mean they're not so recent right like what one two years ago that some... when those changes took place we lost about sixty to seventy percent of our general revenue at the time uh, yeah, for that's context quite significant yeah. yeah so it was but quite significant was, Billy, was uh, we've recovered a, short... a little bit but not a ton uh, there was also a short period was where I think there was I I want to say it was only a week or so but there was a moment where it was cheaper to trade in GTA because there was some incentive for a very short period. I don't recall exactly. Yeah, so th there w there was a, a CCP adjustment where they, I think they just cut all the broker tax or something out of GTA. I can't remember how it was. But uh, obviously that week we, uh, we lost a lot of business that week. But obviously when you're operating in the scale of years, uh, you just look at those situations and you go, okay, it's a hiccup, you deal with it, you move on. I don't think any of the alliances that are enjoying the money from the TTT view that money as something that they are leaning on, I guess. You know, they, they all probably see it as things that pay bills and allow them to do fun stuff, but not necessarily something that they're 100% reliant on. So if, you know, they don't get a strong payment for a week, then nobody's super stressed about it, I don't think. Uh, I got a question about you as a player. Is this like your version of winning? It sounds like I, I have in my mind like the the knight from Indiana Jones and Last Crusade is sitting there amongst all those goblets, but he never leaves. Uh, <laughs> is like this, I mean, for you as far as game enjoyment, what do you do to, uh, I guess, it sounds like a job, but maybe it's not a job. For for me, honestly, this is just a legacy project that I support with my time because I made the agreement to do so. Uh, I don't make any money from the TTT at all, uh, like zero dollars. So I manage the tower uh, because I agreed that I would do it, and a lot of players... Uh, put their trust in me to do so. And if I let that let the towers fall, then obviously their assets, their build jobs, etc. would be at risk. And I view that trust uh, in a pretty important way, I guess. Uh, so fueling the TTT, like I, I generally do it on like one year stints. So I'll take a freighter out, I'll buy... 50 or 60 billion is worth of fuel. I'll spend a day or two fueling all the structures. And then I, I won't think about it for the most part. I log in every day or two to just make sure nobody's um, word act us or see if there's any customer complaints or issues. Every once in a while, I've got to refund somebody's sales tax uh, if they request. Um, but to me, this is just a, a one of those things where uh, I agreed to do something, and because I made that agreement, uh, I'm going to continue to do so. I, I play I, like I'm. A, I have a small corp. We're in Horde. We do fun things. That's how I play Eve. The, the tower is just kind of a side thing that is kind of a legacy for legacy of mine from when I was doing other things, I guess. So this this maintenance of the tower would be like ancillary activity for you. It's not your primary activity. Correct. It wouldn't even be an ancillary, like a tertiary of a tertiary kind of thing. Do you guys talk about secession plans like any real world corporation CEO eventually maybe you move on to another game or of sorts? Unfortunately, that can't really happen. The way in which Eve's uh, ownership and trust system works uh, means that the second I give somebody else a directorship within the tower, they have the ability to asset safety or abandon um, probably a hundred trillion or hundreds of millions worth of people's ISK. Uh, and that means that if I'm going to give anyone that ability, that person has to be uh, trusted beyond all reasonable levels, which means there's basically like two other players in Eva I would trust to do that, which is like Kriba and I don't even know who the second would be. Like you're, you're talking an incredibly minor level of the amount of people that you can trust to do that in EVE are, are pretty much zero. Uh, so chances are, well, actually not chances are, 
the tower goes until it dies in all of reality or and you know I'll keep running it um until I need to it takes you know I I have no issues doing that Did you make the tower like try to benefit like Eve players as a whole or like your no blocks or like who do you view like you talked about everyone wins but like so yes i did uh when i when i said kind of my vision the vision was to provide players the best possible services they could receive um so that they could utilize those services all of the expansionary stuff around the ttt the morassi sotios i inersta facilities the refineries the production sotios uh the new calder stuff that's all stuff that is uh, meant for people who are not the no blocks, let's say. Uh, those facilities generate, I don't want to say no income, but basically no income. Uh, production structures, the way the production tax is set up, where it's almost entirely index based and then the tax percentage is based only on the job, uh, means that the amount of tax that production structures, refinery structures, etc., generate is, is literally almost zero. So we make a little bit of money on the clones there, a little bit in the offices, but like when you compare it in the cost of actually fueling, you know, structures running, you know, five service modules and all the rest, it's almost zero real reason to do it. If we were literally just here for the money and just for the no blocks, there would be a tranquility trading tower and maybe the refinery, and that would be it. Uh, and realistically, that that's just never how I wanted the, the tower to be. I, I wanted to create something that would help all players and hopefully build a little goodwill and just because people don't generally understand how we operate or what we do that desire to generate some goodwill is never really well reciprocated because obviously we pay the no box who are evil uh but that's kind of the goal and i've always kind of viewed the trust of the player base and my ability to provide a service for them as kind of the sacred duty of the ttc So uh, say you were a high secker and had some big dreams of being a part of this, uh, I don't know, income generation. You've talked a lot about how you look out for big groups and contact them before they become a problem. If you were some upstart uh, high sec war deck corporation, pirate corp, how big would you have to be before you start looking at them? Big enough that they're destroying a whole lot of structures and that they can challenge the already established kind of high sec clearance groups um so i remember there was who was it uh somebody came on the radar a, a while ago they had started a war with pirate i think it was and so we started looking they're like oh what's going on here uh but in the end you know they didn't kind of hold together all that long and that wasn't uh didn't become a running concern but certainly any group that wants to get in that way is is got to be large enough that they're they're relevant. I guess you would say they're fle forming fleets in the 30, 50, 100 people kind of range, very consistently with very strong, very strong compositions, and they understand how to operate in their field. If that if that kind of makes sense. Yeah, it does. So, like, Uni, if we were actually a co corporation that war decked us being able to feel like 100, that'd be the appropriate size if we were doing stuff like that? Yeah, you, you would definitely be qualifying in that kind of category, yeah. I see Abraham... Abraham keying up, but not nothing coming into the mic. Uh, okay, um, you first. You first. Uh, so a little bit of conversation about the negotiations at the start. Were there any? Do you have to name names? Uh, any parties that like weren't so keen on one style negotiation or? another or had like uh use of the way things were set up styles of negotiation um 
Or well, like I, um, you mentioned, like the the different ways of like um, formalizing the agreement, that sort of thing. So I, everything that I've dealt with started with like person to person conversations, usually directly with leaders. So at the time I was running test legacy. Uh, and I would have a private conversation with Mitani, and I would have a private conversation with Gobbins or ICY, and I would kind of just lay out how we wanted to operate things, and then I'd talk to somebody else, and back and forth and back and forth. I generally found group chats, uh, larger group chats, to be problematic because there's so many people with so many competing interests. You just try to, you can get yourself in trouble trying to develop a consensus, you know, when four people are saying the same thing at the same time in different ways, and then they all see each other's challenges. So I generally just did thing one co private conversation at a time until we got to the point where we had a rough idea that everybody was agreed upon, and then we could kind of more formalize it into something that would work. That kind of answer you. your question? Yeah, yeah uh, close enough. Thank you very much. Great talk. Why did you choose tranquility of all the systems that bordered Vita? Perimeter, you mean? Or, yeah, sorry, um, perimeter. Perimeter is the main uh, highway system for Jita. So if, uh, like, I don't know contextually how to explain this. Like, Jita is like a crossroads. Like, there's a lot of systems that go out of Jita, but, like, the main gate that everybody leaves Jita from is perimeter. It's got the highest traffic by far, uh, and which is also why the station, when it was remodeled, was switched to phase perimeter. Uh, but also because all of the old stations before we put the tower up were also in perimeter. So it, it just made the most sense at the time. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, fantastic. Um, so I have a question. Since you generate the significant amount of ISK, um, that gives you an ability to play with the market overall. Let's say shifting the best co base cost of the items cost, technical inflation, or buying out completely one commodity and double the price, just like what happened to the Plex, for example, a couple, couple of months ago. Do you have an interest in these activities? <laughs> so, I don't generate the ISK, right? The ISK goes to the tower, and the tower then pushes that ISK to the relevant nullsec layers. However, um, right before a wor World War B, we were on a long-term plan to shift Jita to perimeter. Uh, we had been buying out different sections of the market day by day, moving them to perimeter in preparation for what was going to be a complete Jita buyout and relist in perimeter, forcing people to go to perimeter to get their goods. That plan never came to fruition because the war came in play and then we had to start selling those assets to support activities. Uh, but at the time, we had planned to do that en masse, to buy out everything uh, relevant in Jita. So basically, I don't know, the majority of the primary ship lines and a lot of the uh, relevant module lines, so that if people wanted to be able to buy and fit their ships, they would go to Perimeter versus Jita, which we figured would be the first best step in terms of translating uh, people from one place to the other. And then we would have to do that for... We, we figured it would be a couple of months of having to buy everything out in Jita, move it over perimeter over and over and over again, as people would continue to relist their items in Jita. Uh, that plan never ended up coming to fruition, but we were about five, six trillion uh, in terms of prepping for it when the war kicked off, and obviously then the plan just wasn't a priority at the time. So we have definitely talked about that stuff before, and obviously we saw that as an opportunity to generate an incredible amount of revenue, obviously, because Jita sees, I think, 20x the market that perimeter does or something insane like that but uh obviously it just never came to fruition it, it, it was a fun plan to do but uh yeah <laughs> does that kind of answer your question or like uh... yes it does yes thanks <laughs>